Thank you very much. And I am kind of pissed at Yarrow. Why do I have to go after Elkie and then Tim? I mean, come on, I got set up here. So, hey, thank you so much. And, and, and part of this thing is a conversation with young people about ideas and, and, and experiences. And as Liz pointed out, you know, this has done a lot of cool things and have been very lucky in business and, and had some good breaks along the way. But, you know, back when I was many of your age, for those who were coming here as, uh, as young people with ideas, you know, I worked my way through school smoke jump. I spent six years jumping out of airplanes into forest fires. And when I was your age, my grand ambition in life was to smoke jump, write books, and like ski patrol at Moonlight Basin and raise hell. That's what I was going to do. And had you told me that, hey, you're going to go off and do this stuff and start companies and end up at a place like the London School of Economics, I would have told you you're out of your out of your mind, you know, basically. So just, you never know where you're going in this journey. Um, I, am, I am blown away to be here. I am honored to be here. And my guess is like most of the mentors, it's like, you know, I committed to do this uh, with Yarrow a while ago. Uh, and I'll talk about Yarrow in a second. It's like, me, why is I, who, who the hell wants to listen to me? Uh, and I, I think probably the other mentors feel that way. And, and I certainly do. But I want to share with you um, kind of my passion and, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to do. And Yarrow's kind of like a brother. You know, he and I got connected. I sat on the board of this company, pretty big company. Yarrow was doing work for the guys at the company. Said, hey, you got to meet this Cameron guy. Uh, they were telling me, you got to meet this Yarrow guy. I said, yeah, you betcha. Uh, we'll cross paths down the road. And, you know, I think Yarrow was the same way. Yeah, you professor, whatever. Um, and we connected. And he came in and saw kind of what I was trying to do. And he and I had a chance to, to sit down and visit. And we became very tight. I mean, Yarrow's like a brother. I've talked to Yarrow about some very life in a very detailed, crazy, personal, intimate way. So I, I celebrate Yarrow. Um, what he's done and created here is truly extraordinary. Now, now, the reason I'm here and the reason I've been asked to talk is kind of my view of education. Again, I'm a professor, had a good run. Uh, the London School of Economics, I have no idea how it worked out. When people ask, how'd you get into a place like that? My only reply is, I th the Brits have a sense of humor. You know, and then they, they admitted me just for a chuckle. I, you know, I got lucky. Um, but I want to take you through kind of, I, I want to turn the whole game upside down. That's my ambition. I, I, think, I think education, it's time to reinvent it from the ground up. And a lot of my ideas, I'm grateful to the London School of Economics, how I kind of think in some ways um, was informed by that perspective. They have a very cool way of looking at the world, and I was very privileged uh, to be around those guys. And so what I want to do is talk about kind of my evolution. Um, how, how, how has this worked out? So we're talking about disrupting education, changing it. It's not just something you wake up um, and do. And this has been a journey for me. And, and you know, the smoke jumping deal. I mean, I, the guys yesterday talking about adventure, I forget about what that meant to me years ago. And we'll maybe talk about that at the end. But it's been an evolution in the way I think and, and what I've done. And I want to talk about that evolution um, for a bit. And I want to talk about how it kind of begins with a central idea about people. And then a theory to a degree about people that I'll share with you. And then I want to move on to a view of the economy. So what's going on in the world and what is it that's really troubling us and what are the issues? And then what is the proper response uh, for universities um, from my perspective? Okay, um, people. I don't know where I came up with this. this. I've had this a long, long time. Back, I think back in high school, I figured out somehow um, that, that the most extraordinary people, they come from the most unassuming places. And I, I realized this. I don't know, again, where it came from, but I realized that, wow, you know, the, these traditional paths where we tend to look, that's not where they come from. Um, the people who show up and blow our mind with music and with art and literature and business ideas and innovation, they come from places that we can never predict. And when I kind of got my head around that, that's been a very liberating thing for me. It's given me freedom. Um, because I kind of had to find my own way. I come from a fairly, you know, all the things that have worked out in my life, you wouldn't have predicted that from where I came from. I was the first person to graduate from college in my family. Um, and, it, you know, it was kind of, I was on my own and figuring things out, and I just got lucky. I, I differ from Elkie in that I look at life, luck. I've had so, so much luck, and I'm grateful for that. But this idea of people, that was one of those lucky uh, revelations, I think. Because, again, it's freed me to begin to look out and see, wow, there are these incredible people um, and it's okay to get off that path. I can go look, I can get off the path, and maybe, just maybe, I might be able to do something cool. And that's kind of driven me. And now what I'd like to do, as a professor, it has to come back to a theory. Um, I would like to introduce you to a very peculiar theory of human capital. And uh, 
I was talking uh, with, with friends yesterday, kind of communicating ideas about this. Stacy was one. We were talking about, hey, my idea is where it's going. And so, oh, you got to share this. You got to talk about this. And so I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, this human capital conversation that we have as a nation, this is big. But there's an old saying, H.L. Minken, uh, to every complex question, there's a simple answer, and it's always wrong. And so this complex question about human capital in the United States, um, it's very easy to say, hey, we're doomed. And there are very serious challenges. But there's another portion of this question that de I, I, it definitely deserves further consideration. And that is at the upper level. We as a nation, what's actually going on, we're getting this kind of, you know, as we all, I think, know, a, a, a tiered system. At the highest levels, we are producing human capital that is unprecedented in human history. That these young people, um, if, you, if you look again, I'm, I'm skewing this toward the elite institutions. If you look at Harvard, Stanford, Yale, these institutions, these young men and women that enter those systems, um, 40 years ago, they would have, and again, these are just young men and women entering, they are as accomplished as Rhodes Scholars of 35 years ago, 40 years ago. These are incredible young men and women. Now, this is a peculiar theory of human capital. Um, that's a good thing. That's a, that's a neat thing. And that says, it says a lot, even though I think it's, there's a problem with it. And here's the problem. Um, these kids that are going to these very elite institutions, of which I've had the privilege to teach, so I kind of know what they're about um, at, at uh, a place that had these kids. And so what happens is um, a homogenizing effect. These kids, they learn to move left. They learn to move right. They learn to move through these systems. And they get to these places. Um, and it's, again, they're incredibly bright, they're, they're talented, wonderful, interesting people, but they are becoming very much the same. And so here's my theory, and again, what I want to do is push the conversation, particularly around Montana, and what we can do, because I'm extremely optimistic. And here's my belief, and this is kind of what I'm going to spend the rest of my career um, doing, um, is really testing this hypothesis. Here's my deal. Uh, you look at Montana, you look at these kids that grow up in these small towns, these are interesting cats, and I teach them. Um, you have some very smart kids. Uh, they haven't learned the dance. They don't, they're not going to Brown. They, they haven't learned to move and dance and, do, and juggle and do these things, so they're different. Furthermore, um, they have a little different type of education that's a little bit more broad-based. Um, they have an idea of community. They're connected to something. They've worked with things. They've been responsible for things. Often, they've had an unusual amount of responsibility at a very young age. And so here's my, here's my thing, my hypothesis. That is, these, this very interesting input, this very special type of people that are very different than what we consider to be at the top, I think that's our rocket fuel. And what we as institutions in Montana, the University of Montana Business School, where I have my commitment to, um, we need to change the process. How can we take this very special input, rearrange the process, such that they may begin to create beautiful, wonderful things? And my argument is that actually we are well positioned to have a disproportionate effect on creating extraordinary things here because of those people. And we get them in the right mix, doing the right things, but it requires us to change. And that's what I'm interested in. What I'm gonna talk about are some of those, some of those things. So that's my idea about people. Um, and my peculiar theory. Now for a little idea about education and um, uh, what's, what's going on. And, and the, the art conversation that Tim brought up, I have some, I have some ideas I, I'll share toward the end. It kind of ties in with a lot of these things. Now, what, what's, what have we come out of? The 20th century, basically, and that's how a lot of our institutions were set up, it was a period in which there was extraordinary low economic hanging fruit. There was tons of opportunity, particularly for in the United States. We could kill it. And in fact, we built up a set of institutions that allowed us to kill it. In addition, there were a set of structural, global economic conditions that allowed us to kill it. You know, you go back to where was the world production capabilities at, uh, you know, 1948? It was on the ground. You know, we, we were in a position to do great things, and, and we've done great things. Um, but that's an old world. And what I show my students is, this is the new world. You know, back here, low-hanging fruit, it was easy. You know, that's gone. And basically, where we are right now as a society is we're looking up that ladder saying, how in the hell are we going to get up here? Because that's where the fruit is. That's what, that's what the challenge is. And so we collectively as a society are sitting there saying, son of a bitch, how do I get my ass up that ladder? 
And Tim's conversation, it's about that. I, and I'll tie into that here, how we got to think. But the old institutions, the old way of doing things, that isn't how we got to do it. It's, it's a changing game. So because of this new world, my job as a professor, and I see, you know, I'm 47. And, you know, I, I see myself as part of this generation of professors that our job is to reinvent this, is to, is to invent new shit. And if you can't do it, and, you know, colleagues around the country, the world, or whatever, if, if that's not the game you want to play, you're in the wrong game. Because that's our charge, is to reinvent this that's consistent with reality, where things are going, and this changing world. And so my view is, how do we look at classrooms? How do we look at the room that I walk into as a professor? How do I turn that into an innovation space? Not a space where, hey, Cameron, Dr. Lawrence, you sit there and you profess. That isn't the game anymore. Um, instead, these spaces that I have the privilege of teaching in, these must change. And what we must do in those spaces must change. And we must turn those again into invention spaces, innovation spaces. And I'll talk a little bit about how I'm doing that. Um, so looking at this, this is the business school at the University of Montana. In both UM and MSU, we're lucky. Um, you know, we have very nice facilities at the University of Montana. We've produced some very accomplished people that have risen to the highest ranks. CFO of Microsoft, Bill McGlynn over at uh, HP, basically ran HP's profit center. We, we, we've done really good over time. Um, but if you look at this cool building uh, that's very nice and we're very lucky, um, that was really set up and built around an old idea. And this idea of this kind of silo, and I go do this, I go into a classroom and this is what it is, and I walk over here, I take my accounting class. That, that building, that logic of that structure, that's, that's kind of what it is. And, and what I'm arguing is, we need to take that structure and impose this logic on top of it. And this logic, is, it's different. What must happen in there is different. And this is a good example, tidal pools. Why are tidal pools such fascinating place for scientists? Um, why do they represent this cool thing? It's this really special place where there's a time to kind of cross-pollinate for a while. You bring in things from the sea, sometimes things from the land in there. They brew for a while, and they get kicked back out. They're fascinating, vibrant, wonderful places. But it's an infusion of outside, inside. It's a movement back and forth. It's not a stagnant thing. So it's an ethic and it's a philosophy of cross-pollination that we must fully and wholly um, uh, in, embrace. I mean, AJ's talking about space yesterday and what's going on in offices. I agree. Uh, fantastic. I wanna, how do we do this in a business school? I am, I'm all over it. But this is the ethic that must be imposed upon the old model. So what am I doing? How, how, what, what, how might I contribute? Again, I have an absolute obligation. If I'm not doing it, I'm in the wrong business. Um, and I, I, you know, I should be doing something else. But this is my passion. You know, again, as you guys saw, I'm the accidental academic. It wasn't my intent. I stumbled upon this. I've had a lot of very good luck along the way, made a little bit of money, gave me a little flexibility, not to do nothing but to pursue other things. The London School of Economics was up for a joke, so they admitted me to the PhD program. I got lucky. And, but see, all this luck and all this privilege and good fortune, I also have an obligation to, to try to do something great. And that's what gets me out of bed. If I can't do that at the University of Montana, I really have no interest in going teaching at Yale. When I was a PhD student, that's where my classmates wanted to go, Cornell's where they went and play. Bullshit, I, I wanna go back to Montana, man. That's where the game is. And that's what I wanna do. I wanna do that there. And this is what I am trying to do and it gets me really excited. Um, so my students, and this is how I got connected with Yarrow. It's like he, he, he walked in and he was kind of blown away that they actually do this in business school. So one example, um, and I'm gonna go through several. Um, the assignment. Uh, okay, guys, uh, here's what we're going to do. Um, we, you, you've got 13 weeks to come up with a disruptive innovation. Don't care what it is, come up with one. And furthermore, what we're going to do is we're going to use these big ideas from the Harvard Business School and you college juniors and seniors. I'm going to insist you know this stuff well enough to where I could put you on a plane, fly you to a top 20 MBA program in the United States. You could sit down with my counterpart there and you could tell them a whole lot about the innovator's dilemma. And they can. And you're going to meet a couple of the cats uh, that can do that. Um, and so this disruptive innovation, very, very much based on Clayton Christensen's ideas um, from the Harvard Business School. And again, 
my guess is three quarters of this crowd is fully familiar with it. And, but it's not just enough to come and come up with this plan on a piece of paper. That's, I could really care less about that. I want to see things, build things, build prototypes, cobble things together. Clayton Christensen's idea, it's an, it's an idea about innovation. It's also an idea about architecture. It's an idea about technology. And it's an idea about design. And I want you guys to cobble something together and, 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 and come up with something. Now, some of the things that have come out of this, I'm going to invite uh, one of the students uh, Cody Pedro to stand up for a second and tell him a minute about you sound this came out of uh, one of my classes and, and we'll talk about that in a sec so I've had the fortune of uh, working with Logan head here because he's had a disruptive innovation that is really amazing and I'm having the fortune to work with him on that and he noticed a problem in the music industry and that's that there's four firms they control over 70 percent of the sales that happen around the world and we don't feel like that's the best way to get new, creative, and innovative music out there. So we want to give independent musicians that are out there on a small scale a chance and an opportunity to be heard by the world. So our idea is a website that will be a lot like Pandora, except you'll filter the music by your location, and you can specify that to be as broad as you want. So Montana, Bozeman, whatever, and then specify a genre, and that's the music that you're going to hear and you're going to hear music in your location and on a local scale so that you can hear what's going on in your community, and that's our idea. Great. Thank you. These guys a hand. Here, hey, for those, anybody thinking about getting a PhD and doing this professor gig, here, here's how you succeed. Get students who are smarter than you. Uh, you, you, you can't go wrong. Um, so these guys have kind of come up with this. And they've cobbled, put it together, they've gotten programming help, they've developed a lot of themselves, they've struggled, struggled with problems, they invented it. And that's the future, is, is inventing uh, things. These other guys came up with an idea, and they can't be here, um, but their idea was very different. They questioned social media, or basically social media generally in Facebook, this idea of a social network. They said, you know, actually, there's a lot of different type of networks, and maybe what we need to do is come up with what I kind of call a flash network. That, that sometimes my friends and I, we want social networks that we can put together very quickly, and then we want them to dissolve. We want them to disappear. So we're going out on a Friday night. We're able to kind of add who's in our little network. We can move pictures around, do whatever. And we can, we can determine at 3 in the morning, I don't know why they would choose a time like that, but say at 3 in the morning, all evidence of their little social network disappears. And they're working on it. They're cool. And it's a cool idea that came from these students who grew up in small towns of Montana at the University of Montana doing things. And, the, and these are, that, that's our rocket fuel. That's our, that's our talent. Another one. Um, I, this, the charge of the students was to reinvent in-store consumer electronics retail. Um, and so when you, when you, I've been doing this a while, and so when you, do, when you tell students this, and it's a group project, I, they're art, uh, thinking, okay, yep, no problem, I'll take this part, she's going to do that part, here's how we we'll do it, he's good at math, he'll come up with some quantitative stuff, um, she'll do the synthesis, and we'll come up with the conclusion together. That's how they think. And so I said, okay, yeah, here's what we're going to do, we're going to rethink this industry, how does technology change in it, what can we really do? Oh, and there's a catch. Um, what I want you to do instead of writing that paper that you guys have been uh, cranking out and you can do in your sleep, I would like you to create a video. I want you to do, uh, create a little film that captures your generation's interpretation of in-store consumer electronics retail. Oh, and by the way, I want to know what it feels like. I want to know the feel of this. And so it throws a complete curveball at them, but what they're able to come up with when we throw them that stuff is they're able to do remarkable things. And we're asking them to create, um, which I'll come back to in a minute. Now, whenever you're doing this stuff, you invariably run into questions. I mean, because I'm throwing curveballs at them and do this and figure it out and go from there. And invariably, hey, Cameron, we, uh, what if I can't do it? What if I can't, we can't, we, I can't figure it out? I don't know what to do. That's when I draw upon this. I said, hey, it's really easy. It's, it's really, really easy. This fella named Darwin wrote a book. And uh, in that book, he had this idea, either you figure shit out or you don't. And if you don't, it doesn't work out very well. And so that's the deal. <laughs> Get back and figure it out. And they, they, typically, they typically do. Those who don't figure it out, I tell them, you know what? I think you enjoyed the class so much the first time, you're going to get the opportunity to take it again. <laughs> Try to keep things positive. Um, another pretty cool thing, kind of bring you up the, that's literally ongoing right now. And I'm in the process of negotiating this and finalizing it. But the University of Mon we're taking an interest, of, an equity position in this company, um, which is really cool. It's probably about a $5 million company now. 
Um, and they, what they do is they have a disruptive innovation. They have a really cool application that they've bootstrapped that's in a few banks to manage loan portfolios for smaller banks. And technically, it has some characteristics that ties into core systems. The point is, it's really cool. And so they're trying to think, the guy that came up with it, he's a banker, entrepreneur, successful guy. He has it set aside as a separate company. He's like, I'm looking to do something. So, okay, cool. Liz Markey, my mentor, colleague, and friend, kind of kind of helped facilitate the conversation, made the introduction. And so working with the university, kind of a reverse tech transfer. Why don't we bring in this idea, and uh, we'll have my graduate students tackle different issues related to this product. Um, and then we'll, we'll move this forward. So they're out there engaged, getting really cool things done. Uh, this IBM project, um, a colleague of mine, good friend Eric Tangadol, has taken the lead on this. Uh, my contribution was, A, to kind of encourage the university to do it, but also to offer kind of where, where's the end game on this. And the end game of this project, it's, a, the, only under, it's the only one in the country um, using the IBM Streams technology, this big data platform that IBM has. And so it's a cross-disciplinary class. And so we have uh, students from applied math, computer science, our MIS program, marketing majors, and I think there's some um, media arts majors. And so what the deal is, is, hey, look, guys, figure this out. As a multidisciplinary team, they were, they were basically put in teams based upon their different disciplines, and we want to see what's your business idea, what problem do you want to solve at the end of this, with the hope being that they're going to begin to create really cool companies based on this technology. There's a man named Alex Phillip um, in Missoula who is a rock star. Uh, he should be speaking here. I should be sitting down taking notes, basically. Alex is a great guy. And he, he won like IBM's innovator award type of thing for, for smaller businesses on this. And he has been the real champion that forced this down the university's throat saying, we got to get in this game, I'll help you. But it's really cool. And so, but it's getting them to invent. Um, now, here, so I want them to create, I want them to build, I want them to invent, but there's, there's something missing, and, I, and I'm constantly, that's why it's an evolution. And so what, what the real change happens, they start playing around, and that's neat, and they start to grow, but there's a bigger, more powerful thing that I think happened to all of us at, at some point along the way, and that is we begin to imagine ourselves a little differently. And I want to show you kind of this step, and it just came out, I just, it's rolling out now, Yarrow encouraged me to, um, to, uh, share this here, and you'll see Elkie up there. And so what I've done is to kind of push our students to think more, to imagine more, imagine themselves dis uh, differently, imagine new opportunities. I'm rolling out this site, and I've got four people up there. There'll be two innovators a week. So you guys met Elkie uh, a moment ago. And again, she and I are, you know, both out of Missoula. We kind of end up, we've talked at a couple different things together, and I've gone after her, and I'm always bummed because she, how do you go after Elkie? You can't do it. Then throw Tim in the game, and I'm doomed. But the point is, what I've done here is I asked these really cool, extraordinary people that are based in Montana. I asked them a couple questions. Who are you? What are you doing? Um, what technology do you use to get this stuff done? How do you manage the complexity in your life, the work balance? What ideas have influenced you? And, um, you know, what can Montana do to be a better place? And so, A, some kid sitting in Conrad, Montana, learns about Elkie and says, wow, that's, I, I, that's cool. What a interesting. But furthermore, and those of you who teach or are involved with young people, this idea of technology, they only deal with very superficially. And so what I've done is set up a platform whereby the tools that Elkie uses to do this incredible, inspiring, cool thing, it links out to them. So these young people can go begin to explore how Elkie works. Oh, I'm not? Oh. Oh, that's, that's kind of a bummer. Well, I don't know how we're going to solve that one. But anyway, it's a site that does this. And it's really cool, and I'm bummed you can't see it. Um, uh, MT uses this. Am I back up now? OK. Well, anyway, it's a really cool thing, and I'm, I'm bummed I can, you can't see it. But, but the idea is that it inspires them to check it out. Paul Gladen, my buddy around here, he's also up there. Yarrow's supposed to be up there, but we had a, a little technical difficulty in getting that done. But we'll, he'll, he'll be up there next week. Um, but again, it's to get them to reimagine what's possible and to see these tools and to see really what these tools are is they're leveraging tools. That's what modern technology is. It leverages human creativity. And that's where we are in kind of our journey as, as humanity is we have these remarkable tools that leverage something that's so precious and wonderful, and that's human capital. That's our ability to dream, to create, to design uh, art, basically. And, and that's, that's kind of what I'm about. And so 
I was inspired by John yesterday uh, who talked about his architecture. So what's my work? What's my, what am I working toward in this whole thing? And, and, and one thing that kind of weaves it together and motivates me is it's toward a model of creativity. And that I want our students, and again, this is in a business school, and it's a little sometimes, I think, unusual to have this conversation in a business school, but I think it's very much the future, um, is to show that, hey, your job, what's going on now, is your inventors. And that's where it is. To get your ass up that ladder, you must create. Um, you must be able to begin to design, create, invent, rethink old things in new ways. Um, and so there's an economic motivation. That's the reality of economic life. But there's also something much deeper that parallels that. Um, and that is, that is one of the, the, be the human beings. What is, we're at our best when we create. That's a deeply human, wonderful, great thing. And so it's not just creating for the point of economic success, it's also creating because that's what human beings do when we're at our best. And as we rethink this university environment, um, that's central. And again, we can maybe talk some more about that in the Q&A. How am I doing on time? I got about, you got perfect. Yarrow asked me to kind of conclude with this, and he sat through um, the last, uh, uh, some classes that I taught, and he was there particularly the last one where I give these students advice. Um, these could be my graduate students that are rolling out in the world. They're literally graduating in a couple of weeks. Or this core undergraduate class I teach every spring. I kind of give them, hey, here's, here's my, you know, my thoughts on a successful life. And, um, and, and again, I very much put in there my two cents. Um, first of all, you're going to need the help of others. That's, kind of a, that's, that's the game. You're going to need help. And so that's an easy idea to get in your head. But what I impress upon them is you need to be the sort of person that people want to help. Um, that's really important to do that, to be that kind of person to where someone says, I believe in you, I'm going to give you a hand up. Because I guarantee you, every one of us have had lots of hands up along the way. And then I also tell them, um, you know, so we, we need help. We're looking at other people to help us, but you're also in a position to begin helping. And start reaching down and bringing others up. And you may not see it now as college, juniors, seniors, but you, you can help other people. And by the way, you better, lend a, you better bring 100 people up before you should expect anything from someone else. Your job is to bring people up and it, the, the, the things will come. Furthermore, disappointment. Everybody gets punched. Everyone, we all suffer big disappointment. Every single one of us. And there's two ways of dealing with it. Um, you get pissed and furious and those guys, I'm going to go do my thing. And that's how a lot of us, that's how a lot of people do it. They might, don't do that. The hardest thing in the world, and this takes tremendous discipline, and I struggle with it, is you get kicked, you get down, you just got to just take your breath and just get, and get back in. Show back up with a good attitude. And it's amazing what I've seen happen. Opportunities of people getting just cool things happening to them because they responded to failure well. And the, the other paths that opened up, but also others who admired that in them. Um, don't follow the herd. Forget it. Go your own way. The herd, the, the conventional path through life will get you nowhere. Um, you don't be afraid to get off that path. That's what the most extraordinary people come from the most unassuming places that I've somehow figured out pretty young. And that helped me with that. Get your ass off. If the herd's going that way, go the other way. Um, it, it's, it's, you'll, you'll do well. Uh, befriend artists, writers, musicians, and I should put in here, and other people of dubious economic means, uh, right? Because, hey, it, that's what it's about. Life, you gotta, we got to mix it up a little bit. They have better parties, and we enrich each other is, is, is the point. Um, just about done here. When you get called up to the big leagues, just catch the ball. And again, every single one of us, you know, We've had these breaks, and you know in your career, when some, it's, it's, this is not just the different kind of little opportunity, something different has happened. Um, I've gotten some kind of break, it's happened, we're insecure as hell, do I belong here? Every, I, hell, I have that every single day. You know, do, am I really, should I really be doing this? But when this happens, and you know when it happens, again, it's very different, you, there's the tendency either to freak out and not go, or you get there and you want to just impress. Hey, I'm going to not only catch the ball, I'm going to make a touchdown. Just, when you get there, just catch the ball. Just get in the game. Catch the ball. You belong there. They're going to throw it to you. That's it. Just, just get in the game and get comfortable. And then there's other opportunities. Um, learn to play co uh, pay close attention to what's going on around you. Um, that's huge. There's the world happening around you, and some people are blind to it. And in order to, be, to, to pay close attention, you must be uh, humble, humility. Because you know, there's a lot of shit going on, and you must recognize you don't always see it. And in order to see it, you have to listen. 
And so when you can't go into things fully thinking, hey, I know what's happening here. I've thought all about this. You know, you go in with a bit of humility and really seek to understand. Create an inspiration network. Get them around you because you're going to get down. You're going to get in the dumps. You're going to question what you're doing. Have people you can reach out to that, that inspire you, that, that they believe in you, they know you. You can go out and have a beer or whatever, sit down with, talk with, go on a trip with, go ride your motorcycle across uh, Thailand, Cambodia, which sounds like a kick-ass deal, by the way. Um, but, but they help you. They get you back in the game. Um, and finally, and this is where I'm going to finish, and it's a good place to finish, is express your gratitude. I begin every class I teach literally like this. I go through the whole welcome. I go, look, I'm the luckiest son of a bitch in the world. I can't imagine. I, I'm stunned that I get to do this. It's an absolute privilege for me to have this job. But in turn, it's an absolute privilege for you guys to have this period in life um, in which you can reflect, learn, get exposed to different people with different ideas. Um, be grateful for this and tell other people how grateful you are for the things that you do. And that kind of brings me back to Hatch. And, you know, in, in life, again, done a lot of cool things, been very, very, very lucky. And I, but I'm the one that's kind of charging, going, okay, let's go. We can do this. Let's rethink this. Let's go here. Why don't we do this? Um, and I, I play that, right? I'm happy to do that. But the coolest thing about Hatch and what Hatch really means to me, it's almost like I get here, I can just, whew, um, because when I walk in here uh, and I come to this event, the cool, it's the coolest thing. Um, instead of the, the battles we're out there fighting, we're trying to persuade people, we should do this, we should go there. Everybody here, we, everyone grabs the rope with you and they're pulling. We're all pulling together. Um, I walk in here, it's like, man, there's, a, there's 125 people or whatever that don't really know me, but they're pulling the rope with me. And that I am extremely grateful for. And what you can count on me for is to help pull the damn rope for you too um, as we go forward. So that's a great way to finish up. And these are my, some of my ideas about this stuff. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. And I hope I didn't run over. Okay, great. They're going to try to get the side up. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, super, and that's, that's close enough. Um, it, it's, and we, we can come back to that. Uh, questions, ideas, points of view. So can you describe, I mean, so there's a lot of teachers in the business school. One of my school, students as, here. Aside from you, um, who basically has inspired me to uh, go in the direction I'm going. But basically, a lot of these teachers, they've been reading off, you know, PowerPoints supplied by the school's textbooks for the past four years. And what's kind of the, what is their reaction to your philosophy? And how do you deal with the business school kind of pushing your views? Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's one of those things. I mean, I'm tenured and all that, and I'm very lucky. And, and I'm very privileged in, they weren't always sure what I was doing. Um, there was one instance, if we have time to tell you, but for the most part, I, I started, uh, there was one time very early on, I'm a very young professor and all that, and I'm doing stuff way different. And the department chair kind of got word. The department chair came in my office, shut the door, and said, what are you doing in that class? Oh, yeah, I'm kind of working on this stuff. They, okay, yeah, great. Well, you might want to think about these things. You betcha, that's at the top of my list. That, that was the end of the conversation. And, but what happened, I, I started winning some stuff and getting, it just, it, it got to a point where, okay, whatever he's doing, I may not understand it, fine, let him go. And, I, and I'm very lucky and very supportive colleagues, um, tremendous latitude that I abuse. Um, I'm an MSU student, and uh, one of the things, I have a bunch of innovations that I wanted to implement, but at MSU, they have this thing that says, when you build it at our university, they own it. And so how do you get around that when you're teaching your students like the U sound over there? Yeah, it's how, really, how and, that's, and that's a great question. Are you a graduate student? Okay, yeah, and that's particularly troublesome in the graduate program, particularly around the sciences, um, the innovation stuff. We really don't have that problem. I, the university with these guys, really, it's not involved. This is stuff they're working on. Hey, you guys go do it. It's a class project. This isn't owned by the university uh, at all. So the university has no claim, really, to it. And... That's not the environment we want. Yeah, yeah. Again, they, they give me a lot of latitude. I just do my thing. So, Cameron, um, okay, I, I'm going to try to pass that to you. I love your passion, and I know teacher likes you have a huge responsibility in the future of the world, not only about people. Which makes me nervous. So, I love the fact you, you talk about human capital, but I... I have the tendency because I travel around the world and the world 
is not this world. And when you say, when we say we want to create a better world with our innovation, which kind of world we are mm -hmm. talking? The world of the world or the world of economics? Yeah. The world of corporate? And, and, and more, it's about ethics. I never heard in, in, uh, in today or yesterday about ethics when we teach people. Mm -hmm. And if we were teaching ethics, maybe when all your students or Stanford or Yale or uh, London, they become at the head of big companies, they will think twice before they invent something who might destroy the world, might destroy people's uh, lives somewhere else in the world. So I think when we, you know, it's like what Tim was saying, you know, culture is everywhere in the world and you struggle in America for many reasons that I don't understand, but elsewhere we have lots of money for arts. And there, there might be a reason why. So, and America is very far away, you know, we, we think that and we, America has always been a model for Europe, for a lot of, uh, of young people, because you invent, you create, uh, it's in a very innovative country, and, but there is something that has been lost. And I think the human capital you bring back there, I like it a lot, but it's, it's more than just that. You know, we cannot create anything without human person, without a being. And, and the, it's very important which world, we, when we say we want to create a better world or we, we want a better world, which, which kind of world we are, to, we yeah. are speaking? I, 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 oh, no, 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 I, I get it completely. And th these, these are big philosophical conversations, so let's jump into one. Um, so, so what's the real problem? You want my opinion? And I have a somewhat informed point of view on this. Because really what we're talking about is the decline of the liberal arts. Um, and so kind of in my, in my view, and, and perhaps a critical question we could ask, okay, Cameron, this is really ambitious, cool stuff, and you want to do this. But in this crazy world, the world's change. Is the, is the American Research University even the right place to have these sort of things happen. Is this really the place we can expect this? And my argument is yes, it is. And it ties into your deal, ethics, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. And really what this is, is why have the liberal arts lost almost legitimacy? Not only in society, but also within the academy. And there is a lot of very interesting people that have thought about this, and one of the most um, important arguments that I buy into is a guy who was the dean of the Yale Law School. He was a classics professor. PhD in classics, and he goes to like Chicago, gets his law degree, whatever. Really smart guy. And he tried to look at system. What's happened? Why have the liberal arts lost their legitimacy? And he places it on liberal arts departments. Because the liberal arts, the, arguably the best part of the university, fundamentally what's it about? What's the nature of the well-lived life? How do we treat other people? How do I fit into this? How do I want to live? What's the best human beings have ever created? Um, what do I think about it? What might I contribute to it? Where did it come from? These are, these are the deeply most meaningful questions we have. But the argument goes that the liberal arts faculty have lost legitimacy because they no longer stand up and make the argument that this is what it's about. It's about living a better life. And we have something better to say. There are some ideas better than other ideas. And the argue, argument is that it, they, they move into a relativistic um, perspective that comes from trying to model the physical science research methodology because they are trying to seek legitimacy within the academy. How do you do that? If my research approximates that of the physicist, isn't that cool stuff? So if I, as a literature professor, go into really abstract, weird, crazy stuff and uh, you know, delineate weird little topics, that approximates scientific reductionism, of which we might be able to um, extrapolate beyond just this case. It uses a very rigorous methodology, which again are notions from the physical sciences. But what if that isn't the case? What if that isn't what it's about? Beauty, what is, how do you quantify that? Um, so I, I think it, all this gets tied up into that conversation, but I, um, I believe deeply that we as a nation and, well, to a degree, the world needs uh, the American research universities to reclaim the importance of the liberal arts. Um, you know, Steve Jobs said it best. What's he really do? He takes the best of the liberal arts and the best of what technology is, and he creates beautiful things. And that's really what my discipline, this information system stuff, taking the best of what human beings can do, taking the best of what technology can do, and doing wonderful, beautiful things. Um, but but I, th I think that's what we need to do, is reclaim the liberal arts in, in education. So. Cameron, we, we're almost out of time, but I one comment here and one question, because this is too interesting to cut off that quick. 
Cameron, nice job. I just wanted to make a quick comment. That model you talked about, I, I, I think it was the student model where you, you provoke something and then you send a, a team out to look at it, more of an inter interdisciplinary mm -hmm. team. So it, check out uh, General Electric. They're very, uh, like them or don't like them, they're very prolific in terms of ideas. They came right out of Thomas Edison uh, years ago. But it's really funny, such a big company. They'll, they'll take an idea that has to push the envelope and they'll give it to, a, they call them tiger teams. Mm -hmm. And they give them to a, and it does not have to be an interdisciplinary team, although it would be nice if it was. But one thing it has to be is they call it fire in the belly. So you may have three or four people on these small teams who have a fire in the belly for that idea that's pushing the envelope. And they'll just send them away to have half a day on Fridays paid where they just depart from their normal role and they work on that particular idea. Then they bring it back to the organization and throw it in their lap and say, you guys built some practicality in it, but this we've taken it to a, a new level of thinking on it, which I think is really cool that you'd be doing that with students. Yeah, it's, and, and you're spot on. And that's a really common, hey, it should be a multi-disciplinary you know, disciplinary perspective. You're, you're spot on. But the problem is, us universities, we're not always well positioned for whatever for well, for some good reasons actually to, to do these things but you are spot on that's a great way of doing things it's a leading idea in a lot of companies that change the world and we need to do more of it um so um there's a lot of online learning online uh, business going on now and i'm wondering when you're talking about creating that space of innovation um and i know this is like an increasing trend for in every area now um how what are some things that maybe you do specifically if you are involved in that at your university or just in general of how to create that space without face-to-face -face time. Yeah, and see, I love the online stuff. And, he, and here's the deal. Okay, well, this university stuff's changing. You can put some things online. Hey, that's fantastic. And a very, again, to every complex question, there's a simple answer. And, and sometimes my colleagues, the simple answer is, this is bad. Bullshit. Because what this freeze, what it does basically by having certain things in an online environment, um, it frees us up. Well, let's ratchet up the game. Because remember, we have these innovation spaces. And so if we can move certain things online and we bring people into this room, this is a creation space. Fantastic. That other stuff I don't necessarily have to deal with. Let's move it, move it on. So I look at it as a very positive thing. Now, my own teaching stuff, um, I, I don't do any online classes. As faculty, we have these teaching loads and all that stuff. And, and my game is, I, I want to walk in front of a group of students and say, okay, let's go. And that's what I'm good at. And truly, if they said, Cameron, man, you, we want you to do revolutionized online stuff, I'd say, you know what, thanks a lot, guys. This has been a really good run. Um, got some other business stuff going on. I'm a pretty lucky guy. Uh, I'm going to go find Karen, and I'm going to go to Big Sky, just like I wanted to do 25 years ago. And I'm going to ski patrol, write books. And I won't smoke jump anymore. That was a, that's a very much a young man's game. And that was a long, long, long time ago. But hell, I'll live in Big Sky with my wife and write books and uh, harass Yarrow, you know? <laughs> Great. Well, okay, thank well, you, thank Cameron. you very much.